First Act, Part 2, by Routes Bloodthorn. Slimas limped across the command deck, before settling into the captain's cradle. The air still smelled of scorched metal, lubricants, and organic compounds, but the smoke had cleared, meaning that the damage control had gotten the fires out, and environmental systems somewhat repaired. Slimas coughed, feeling his barking sack swell, pulling at the recently regenerated skin on the side of his neck, then looked around. Most of the original bridge crew was either dead or injured. Nearly a fifth of the ship's crew was dead. A third of the rest in heel sleep were being attended by medicos in the infirmary. The ship, judging by the view screen, was still dead in the water, slowly tumbling on all three axes through the depths of space. The trailing wisp's purple and blue glitter that was slowly leaking into space from the damaged jump space engines gave a spiraling testimony to the fact that they were still moving at a decent speed. At least if they had been in a solar system. Slimus gave a burbling sigh. They were in between stars, which meant no chance for help, and any planet that might sustain them until they could repair the ship's engines was too far away to reach in a dozen lifetimes. Of course, a jump-scorched ship wasn't bad enough. Neither was a dead captain and first mate. Of course not. The universe just had to urinate on Slimas' tail, and the tail of everyone on the ship. It's confirmed, acting Captain Slimas, the former weapons technician hissed, looking up. I managed to get a clear picture with an optical camera, but it's not any ship I saw in training. Slimas sighed and looked at the data screens surrounding the captain's cradle. They were all cracked and discolored from the jump scorch. Throw it on the main screen. I guess we should all see what's coming to step on our tails. The weapons technician, so low-ranked he didn't even actually have a name, bobbed his head in submission. The screen... A third of it not working and discolored, wavered for a moment, then showed an image of a ship, concentric sensor rings, and a line that started at a circle a little ways away and was slowly approaching. It dropped into real space just over thirty cycles ago and immediately headed straight towards us. I thought at first they were locking us with weapon ranging systems, but after they started blinking a laser... In the low red range at us, I realized they were scanning and trying to communicate, the weapons tech said. And what do we know about them? Slimas asked. Nothing. The dedicated scanners are offline. I pointed one of the docking cameras toward them, but they're too far away. What scanning I can do shows a dead ship approaching. Not even enough power for weapons tracking despite the fact that they are scanning us with a low red laser. The nameless one said. He pointed out a window on the screen that showed a faint glimmering speck. That's it, right there. And their approach. Slimus knew the answer, just looking at the screen. They're pulling extremely high acceleration still. At their current rate of acceleration, they'll overshoot us in six cycles. At their current rate of speed... If they were to cease acceleration, they'd overtake us in nine cycles. There's no way any sapient we know of can survive the kind of deceleration that they'll have to undertake in order to slow down to match velocity with us, the weapon technician said. An attack run? Slimas asked. The unnamed tech flicked his tail in a motion to signify that anything was possible. Can we reply, communicate? Slimas asked. Request the right of surrender? The only other officer on the bridge made a sign of negation. No, acting high one, with the power plant damaged and our computer systems damaged, we cannot spare the power or the computing cycles for repair, life support, and medical to attempt to contact them. Alert the crew, sing our death songs. I will pray to the Forgotten Ones that they are not here to attack us. But... Let our souls be prepared, Slimas said. The other two officers looked grateful and left the bridge to return to their quarters, 
to sing their death songs and perform death rites. Slima sat and watched the steadily approaching Dot. He had nothing else to do. Slimas watched the alien ship get closer. After five cycles, it had suddenly decelerated, as if it had begun sliding on thick syrup. The twinkle had grown steadily larger as the alien ship approached, until now, almost a full cycle after it had begun to slow down, he could see plenty of details. Whoever made it didn't care about aesthetics. It was anodized black, with protrusions and thick hammerhead foredeck. It had four massive engines, held away from the craft by swooping struts. The engines glowing and thrumming with such power that Slimus could swear he felt it in his bones. Whoever had built that craft had made sure it was constructed to deliver a simple message. We don't like you, we don't like your burrow, and we don't like your eggs. He ordered the nameless one who he'd begun to refer to as Slinner in his own mind, to switch off any kind of targeting system, and to only observe it through the visual spectrum. I thought you said it didn't have power, the communications officer snapped at Slinner, growling and flaring his ruffles. I can see light coming from it. We can detect that, but no power aside from that, and my instruments claimed it was stellar light reflecting off debris, Slinner answered. Then you are as stupid as your instruments, the communications officer snarled. Easy, easy. He can only tell us what his instruments can detect, Slima said. The engines produce no power I could detect. The ship itself radiates no power. According to the instruments, before I switch them off, there is nothing there, despite what our eyes see, Slinner replied, staying unruffled. We can see the lights from it the communication officer snarled. Slimus had begun thinking of him as Snapjaw, and wished there was someone else who could run the communication software. And my instruments, except for that camera, do not see the lights. Must I record that statement and play it on a loop for you to understand? Slinner asked. That is impossible. Are you incompetent? Snapjaw started to rant. You're blinky. Slinner suddenly said, pointing at Snapjaw's data display. Snapjaw turned back to his display, frowning. It was an incoming communication request, and an incoming data link request. Snapjaw hissed his frustration, working the unfamiliar menus until finally the light stopped blinking. Slima sighed, a rattling sound in his throat, and swept the icons on his screen, to bring up the communication window on what was left of the main view screen, replacing the concentric rings that merely showed that the foreign ship was practically on top of Slimas's inherited vessel. The screen flickered and showed the image of, at first glance, what looked to be some kind of bipedal construction robot. It took Slimas a second to realize that it wasn't a robot, but rather some kind of armored vac suit. Ah, jump drive failure, huh? The figure asked in perfect hashinesh. Captioning ran across the bottom, and in the upper right there was an image of his own ship with a jump drive exploding and a query mark over it. Affirmative, Slimas answered. I'm going to scan you. Is that permissible? The armored vac suited figure asked. Affirmative, Slimas answered. Stay on the image. I want to make sure I don't boil you alive or something, the figure said. Man, it's been a long time since I dealt with the living. Hang on. Slimas expected the scan to take a long time, but it was less than a few breaths before the figure suddenly started moving again. Ah, you've got a damage jump core, your computer system is electromag shocked, you've got structural damage and a lot more, the voice said. Slimas found it odd to not be able to see the other sapient's face but was willing to ignore that if this sapient was willing to help his injured crew. He just nodded, and the figure nodded its head. All right, I can get you going again. There was silence for a long time, and the figure made a mechanical sighing noise. You have to invite me on board. Those are the rules, it said. Slimas nodded. I invite you, strange one, onto my humble vessel. The figure nodded, and the image cut. 
It was bigger than Slimas had thought it would be. It moved mechanically. Its joints hissed and purred. He could hear it using sonar and high frequency. Its body seemed to be full of machinery and tools. It had a quadruped following it, some kind of industrial robot, with four legs and a strange-looking head that often made weird, sharp staccato noises. For nearly fourteen cycles, it worked tirelessly. Slimas learned that the quadruped robot was called Fido, and that the figure was called Daxin in its own tongue. At one point, Slimas approached the figure, who had just exited the jump core, slapping its hands together. Are you artificial? Slimas asked. The figure shook his head. No, nope, clinically immortal, but originally biological, it said. Slimas pondered that answer for several cycles, unable to come to grips with what it might mean. All right, this should get you back home. I took the liberty of checking your astrogation files for the closest system. You're lost by about 12,000 light years, but you should be all right now that your jump drive is tuned, Daxon told Slimas at the airlock. You've got food, water, and enough power to get back, but not much more. What caused it? Slimas asked. Jump space rapids. They must have shifted since the last time you surveyed that section of jump space. I'd have your government run probes on all major shipping lines, Daxon said. I put my estimations and data on a file. Daxon paused halfway out the lock. Slimas had gotten used to how Daxon would just exit the lock, use a reactionless drive to move back to his own ship, and then return, as if space was his natural element. Look, acting Captain Slimas, it's either you hit what my people call rapids, or... He squatted slightly and put his helmet near Slimas's ear. Or sabotage. He straightened back up. Anyways, good luck. Try not to let anyone step on your tail, all right? Wait, Slimas asked. I have one request. Sure, my scaly brother. Ask away, Daxon said. May I see your face, so the crew and I may pray to the Forgotten Ones for you properly, Slimas asked. Not a good plan, my friend, Daxon said. You said you are alive. My religion and beliefs, Slimas started. All right, since it's your religion, remember, my scaly friend, you asked for it, Daxon said. The faceplate opened, and Slimas found himself staring at horror. Liquid bubbled in a duraglass tank. Inside, a lower mandible floated beneath a pair of blue eyes that were attached via the optical nerves to thickly furrowed cerebral tissue that was embedded with electronics and wires. All of it was floating in the tank. Slimas rapidly inflated and deflated his sparking sack to keep from fainting as the plates closed at the front of the helmet. He heard Fido make the same noises and looked down to see the armored plate had retracted, showing the same horror inside Fido's head only the mandible longer and sporting conical teeth. The plate closed. You asked, buddy, Daxon said. Let's go, Fido. Slimas watched as the thing cycled the lock and left. He staggered to the bridge. The appearance of his crew's benefactor burned into his mind. He collapsed into the captain's cradle and stared at the view screen. He's hailing us, Snapjaw said. Put it on, Slimas said. The armored figure appeared again. Now that the screen had been repaired, he could see Fido was folded up in a wall behind him, the head detached and sitting nearby. I'm gonna go slow till I'm away from you. You guys go ahead and go first. I'll tag for a ways in jump space, then head on out, all right? Daxon asked. Slimas bobbed his head. Before the feed could be cut, Slimas slapped his tail almost wincing as he got Daxon's attention. When he realized he had the alien's attention, he asked the question that had been bothering him since the airlock. Why do you keep the jawbone and eyes? he asked. Because it's funny. Slimas testified to the Unified Exploratory Council that the creature he had encountered had claimed to be clinically immortal 
and had required permission to board, working without any apparent rest. The council met for an emergency meeting, two separate species being encountered in the same rough region, deep in the dead zone, within the same time frame of a handful of great cycles, was cause for alarm. If there were two Xeno species, there could be more. From Daxon Freeborn to Confed Nav Int Encountered a new Xeno sapient in need of assistance, rendered assistance according to the clinically immoral code of conduct, repaired their vessel, and sent them on their way. Attached is a financial statement of the remuneration due to my descendants for providing this aid as the representative of the Terrasol Confederacy. Attached is schematics for a light frigate of a previously unknown Xenosapient. Also attached is medical data, gleaned from the ship's own computers. Attached is a copy of their library core. Copying information in such manner is permissible under the clinically immortal code of conduct. I really haven't gone over the data files because, honestly, I don't care. The captain seemed nice. Try not to glass his planet or something stupid like that. No reply is required. Just leave me alone. Nothing follows in my footsteps. From Fido Freeborn to Confed Nav Int. They were lizards. I don't like lizards. A lizard bit my foot when I was still squishy. New lizards did not bite my foot. Daxon is still good boy. Fido is still good boy. We hunt further in the dark. Nothing follows 